<sighs> so, uh, you know, nostalgia is a word I think about a lot whenever you and I meet. Um, I would say you're a n- nostalgist, nostalgist. That's one way I would, one word I would use to describe you. Uh, yes, absolutely. You think that's fair? Uh, very fair and probably, it's probably one of my flaws as well. <laughs> I'm a little too nostalgic, you know. It's interesting you use the word flaw though. Why do you think it's a flaw? It can be very crippling. It could be something that, um, for me in particular, I get so nostalgic about it, like a, a feeling, um, like a memory or something I'm trying to recreate, I guess, you know, with uh, my writing or whatever, you know, I just get wrapped up and fall down that rabbit hole of memory lane. And, you know, it starts to, uh, I get a little emotional about it. Like I want to go back to those days or I want to re, you know, wish I couldn't, I think the thing would, you and I were talking before about, if you would have known something was going to be as impactful on your life as it has become, you would have embraced it a little bit more the first time, you know, you would savor that flavor. And I just, all those things. And I think everyone goes through it. It's like, you know, like what What, for you, what would that be? Like movies, the first time seeing a movie, you know, or just like, you know, um, I don't know. It's just like, uh, these, like, you know, the, the memories I have of a certain, I don't know, a childhood event, you know, like the first time going to Lakeside or whatever, you know, or seeing, you know, um, the return of the Loon Dead for the first time, Mm -hmm. you know, how something like that was, is very impactful. And like, even when I go back to Lakeside and it's just so dingy and Lakeside, the dingy amusement amusement park. Yes. Yeah. And like, but going there and just like where most people are just like, oh man, that place is ghetto or that place is just filthy. And for me, it's just like, no, you're, you got to see beyond the trash that's littering the ground. You just have to see it for what it is. And, you know, <laughs> look beyond the trash that's littering your soul. Yes. Yeah. Enjoy this. There's few of these left. I feel like I'm just rambling and I'm not really uh, making. Uh, well, I think it's an interesting topic because it comes up every time you and I get together. And we've known each other for 30 years almost. Almost. Yeah. So, well, here, when I mention crippling, you know, how it's a flaw, mm-hmm. it's um, you you and I, like you just said, we always talk, yeah. you know, about our childhood. Yeah. We always go down memory yeah. lane yeah. and we never get anything done because we're always just revisiting uh, our past yeah. and talking about it yeah. instead of like, you know, embracing our past and using it to push forward in our future. I guess I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to embrace it and push it forward in, in a productive way for me. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's very difficult for me to do that. Um, I, I recognize that I have that same yearning for nostalgia. You know, I really do. And, and I can't escape its grip. But I found that it, a lot of people have turned it into quite a commodity. You know what I mean? They, you know, shows like Stranger Things, um, but even these documentaries about our former action figures, you know, but things, shows like Comic Book Men, uh, there's a there's an industry built on nostalgia, you know, that seems to really permeate the culture today. Um, big Bang Theory seems to be really big on nerdy kind of things. I think what's strange about that is that, you know, I never remember my grandfather talking about the toys that he grew up with with, with as much of a hard on as we do, you know what I mean? Or, or even my dad for that matter. No, you're right. I think our generation is the first generation to kind of do that. Um, it's definitely like, you know, you have you and I have always mentioned how we were born in that weird uh, bridge between analog and digital mm-hmm. in a sense. And um, where the guys, you know, who are making like, you know, Tarantino is very like, you know, he's a very uh, nostalgic obvious uh seems to be. filmmaker yeah. um all his movies are you know he's duplicating or replicating what he um grew up watching on tv you know same thing with uh kevin smith you know these guys who are almost the pioneers of you know taking something from their childhood and making a career off of it and everyone's just kind of like riding on their you know coattails about it yeah and they make it look really easy don't they, they? Do. they make it look very enticing like that is something we all uh, either could be or should be doing, but but to speak to your point about like Tarantino's not of our generation. You he's know? not. He's a bit older. He he is a bit older. So but I think so like, not our, our generation. Maybe because we what are we? We're we're millennials, right? We're the oldest I, end of millennial, I think. 
We're the youngest of Gen X. I think we're the oldest of millennials. I don't embrace the millennial. Everyone I, always says we're millennials. I, I see maybe, but I don't feel it. I feel closer to the Gen X gener- generation. Me too. I, I feel like I speak their language more. Absolutely. You know the the music, the films, the '90s rock, the the comedy from that era. And um, like my older sister is a Gen X, and you know, growing up and kind of just like. Mimicking almost a lot of stuff that she's in, like the music she listens to, the way she dresses, you know, the way she talks. Uh, so that's why I kind of like connect. I had a sibling who is a Gen X and, you know, I connected more with my older sister than my younger sister, you know, growing up. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with it or just, you know, I, I feel like I am a very old soul, you know, like everything I watch, I... I'm such a purist to her. It's like I can't really be bothered with remix as much, you know, or just roll my eyes. So it's like, oh, they're doing that again. Right. You know, Right. where, you know, Erica's a very... Um, Who's Erica? Yeah, my, <laughs> my fiance. You know, seven years younger uh-huh. than I am yeah. and uh, is a millennial at heart. You know, she is the definition, you know. Like, I have a hard time with this, my smartphone, you know. It's like I can't figure out. <laughs> like, like, I feel like that's the stereotypical old guy who's yeah. like, how the hell do you work this gizmo, you know? <laughs> I'm just scrolling through things, and she has to set things up for me, you know. It's like, it, it's embarrassing. It's, it's like, a little I don't, embarrassing, it, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, look at you. You have a hard time, like, figuring out the computer stuff, you know? Yeah, a little bit, Yeah. Well, I think she, in my, in my defense, my catchphrase, I don't think she'd have an easy time with that either. I challenge Erica to produce a fucking podcast. You're, you're right. But, <laughs> but uh, I understand what you mean. Point taken. I still struggle around some of it, too. But a lot of that, I don't feel, I feel it's, I'm capable. I'm not interested is more of the difference. Does that make sense? I don't want to get sucked into that world so much where it becomes second nature to me. Uh, maybe I, maybe my, that's my own problem is I hold on too much of well, my for, analog past. For me, I, um, I definitely embrace the uh, convenience of living in a digital world. Yeah, sure I mean, as a too. filmmaker, it's so much easier. I mean, but then I feel like a total tool by using that word filmmaker because I'm not really making a movie out of film, am I? I guess that's kind of weird, but that's a whole different debate, really. Do the words mean what they used to? I mean, I think it's a catch-all phrase that still works. Right. Yeah. So, because I'm not going to say, I'm a digi-maker. No. That's stupid. Yeah, but give it time. It'll enter into the a day-to-day verbiage. Yeah. But I think my um, hesitation on, like, really embracing things is just stubbornness or just um, fear of letting go. You know, mm-hmm. because it has, you know, been such a huge part of my life. Like I, I made it such a big part of my life. Like all, you know, the nostalgic, you know. Uh, Do you know what the word means? Nostalgic. Yeah, what that, what the word nostalgia means? No, I can't. I think tell. it comes from Greek, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And I, I think it means something like return home. I and mean, it's kind of a beautiful word. It is it? return home. You know, just so what? What is it about? That those those toys those movies that is home to you. But that's what it is, isn't yeah, it? That's the yeah. desire to keep reliving it. Is because you want to go back home. You want to go to a safe place. Yeah, I guess like you know. So, for instance, watching uh, the Netflix documentary, the toys that made us. Mm-hmm. Um, you and I briefly talked about them, but yeah. like the there's an episode all about the. Uh, Masters of the Universe Mm -hmm. uh, action figure line. Yeah. And, you know, that was, as far back as I can remember, like, that was, like, the first toy I played with was the He-Man ones. And I had a a huge collection of them. And there's certain, and they just, there's something about them, like, the smell, you know? And so watching that documentary, I just got this huge, like, aroma of that plastic and like there's I'm some sure I can still smell it right now yeah. yeah and there's like even certain figures that were like you know had this fab this fuzz on them you know and this and one of them was like a skunk man and he stunk bad because he was supposed to that was his superpower you know he was supposed to <laughs> I don't remember that. it was weird you know but like they all they had this weird aroma it's like you know and even the ninja turtle action figures mm-hmm. you know um the first time that like my friends had a uh, I was always a kind of the person who would lag behind on getting action figures you know um 
I wasn't extremely spoiled as a kid. You know, I wasn't also, I didn't, I wasn't like without toys, you know, just, right. um, but when you did medium toy satisfaction. Yeah. You know, I had, I had a lot of, um, hand-me-downs and, uh, whatever I might've wandered out of a daycare with in my pocket, you know? Yeah. But, um, I remember the first time my dad took me to a Toys R Us to buy, uh, the Ninja Turtle action figures. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the, uh, why he took me, you know, I don't know what his purpose or motive was maybe just to be a good dad. I mean, he surprised me sometimes, but I just remember him taking me and didn't tell me where we're going. He's like, let's go for a ride. We ended up in, you know, the parking lot and as a kid, you know, like, you know, I think I was six or seven and had those rainbow, you know, uh, walls and, you know, the big Toys R Us sign, Jeffrey Giraffe, the whole f fucking thing. And it just, you know, it's, it's like going to Disneyland as a kid, yeah, you know. Yeah, of course, I remember. You know, going through the automatic doors and there's that corridor, like I was saying, with all the rainbow coloring. And he's like, um, he took me to the wall that had all the Ninja Turtle action figures and, you know, because the cartoon is already out and I was obsessed with the cartoons and he was just like, you know, help yourself. And I was like, well, and I went and first action figure I grabbed in my hand was, you know, Leonardo. Yeah. And my dad's like, he's like, that you can get more. And I was like, oh, shit, well, I'm going to get all four of them. Yeah. And then I got all four and I was like, but and now I got to, they got to fight someone. So yeah, I was allowed to get Shredder, but that was, I had, you know, the four that turtles was, and the Shredder. Oh man, so cool. Yeah. And I remember just going home and just like being excited and like, the drive home and it was dark out and like you know I was trying to look at the tur the the pa I didn't open them in the yeah. I was I was really like you know uh, neat about like how I would do this it was a process the opening of the totally, figures yeah you know I, yeah. I didn't rip them open in the car because you know I've made mistakes in the yeah. past and lose exactly, shit you know? yeah yeah so like I waited and they had that like um, it was like the you had to clip the the fucking weapons out of that little. Um, I forgot how it was packaged, but it was like in this little rectangle and they're all kind of like connected together and you had to like twist them to snap them free, you know? Yeah, uh, I remember that, yeah. And so we got home, ran to my room, opened the, the package up and there's just like this that hit of that plastic, yeah, you know? Yeah, And uh, It smelled like freedom. Exactly. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, it was just, uh, I'm just going right now in my head just thinking about it. So... Yeah, it's just weird things. Like when you watch that show, it's just like it's taking you back into like. It is. Yeah. I remember the first time I got my Ninja Turtles. I remember yeah. just like yeah. the first time opening them, and. So you associated a lot, at least in this version, with stories of your father. Oh well, yeah, so, with the turtles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with the turtles. Turtles equal dad. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Well, no, it does because. Um, but that, is that that return home to you? It's a return to a yes, a place that I I liked as home. You know, I had a really. Um, traumatizing childhood, I would say, and a lot of re resentments I have towards my parents still. Um, so there's moments where I see where this is nostalgia, this return home, and things that I li I love, and that has become like a, a ritual in a sense, and it just reminds me of you know the good times I had with my parents. I guess you know, for instance, um, North Rio on video, video, you know, that was such a, an important place. You know, and I just took my niece to that Seven Eleven right there, and I was telling her, I was like, that liquor store." Which that was a lot. It was, the setup was for anybody who's seen Clerks. It's very, very similar. Small little independent video store right next to a convenience store. Right. Place where we hung out all the time as kids. Absolutely. It was the coolest video store. Uh, talk about a smell of plastic. Like you could smell the all the plastic from the movie boxes. Yes, the, 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 the wrapping yeah. over the boxes and even yeah. the, styrofoam the styrofoam inserts. You know? Inside the VHS boxes. Yeah, the old posters everywhere. Posters stand, and cardboard stand-ups. All the promotional gimmicks. Oh, it was like heaven. It was amazing. Yeah, it was heaven for movie lovers, for sure. But as I was saying, I, like, when I, I took my niece there, um, I took her to see Frozen 2. We stopped at 7-Eleven to get some snacks and that is at 7-Eleven. And as we pulled in, I was pointing to the liquor store now that sits in the video mm -hmm. store spot. And I was telling her, that liquor store is a very important place. It's one of the best places in the world for me. And she's <laughs> like, oh, I don't believe you. And I was like, 
no, before it was a liquor store, it was a video store. And she just had this puzzled look, you know. <laughs> Imagine trying to explain it to a seven-year-old what a video store yeah, is. Yeah, seriously. You know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I never thought about that. And did you try? Ah, uh, no, I gave up. I was like, let's just go get some candy. Yeah. <laughs> she yeah. Just, it was not going to work. So when you've but... been in that liquor store, can you smell it at all? Still? No. I mean, we've, uh, we've, we've tried. Yeah. We've tried sniffing around. We took Jersey Mike there. Uh-huh. We did, yeah. I've been there a couple times. I never smelled it. It's, you know, I drive by it and I look at it and it's just, they, it's weird because even like the liquor sign mm-hmm. yeah. is the same font exactly, and color yeah. as yeah. the North Yarn video. Yeah. So I just see that and I'm like, oh man. But like talking about returning to home, you know, when I first moved out here from Jersey, we lived right across the street from that, you know, but some, for some reason we always drove there. <laughs> But it was like a uh, Friday night ritual because there's always that pizzeria right there in that corner. Yeah, that's always been a pizzeria. And right around the side, there's 7-Eleven and then the video store. You know, and every Friday night, we hit that pizzeria, place our order, you know, walk over to the video store, choose our movies. I was always the last one. So my dad, you know, he, him and my mom, they would pick something and uh, they'd always like tell him whatever the, the kid's going to get, you know. They always had me prepaid, and I just have to go in and just whatever I decide I'm going to rent, they'll just switch it and I'll go and meet my parents usually at 7-Eleven or picking up the pizza. Sometimes they already had the pizza and whatever they're getting from 7-Eleven, they had to drag me out. You know, you're getting what's in your hand now. But it was always like one of those things like I looked forward to it all week long, you know. Yeah. Pizza night or Chinese food or whatever. But it was always Friday night was family night, you know. We'd always rent a movie. We'd always just together you know and um i think after my parents divorce and that's why i like just reverted to like spend all my time there was like it was just that memory you know <laughs> Jeez. just you know kind of like a sad image though i guess the only kid just hanging out waiting for his parents to get back together <laughs> <laughs> well it wasn't i wasn't waiting for them to get back together but it's just i i guess like talking about it it makes sense that like i found comfort yeah. you know because that was like the good times that yeah. like, you know I, I don't remember my parents arguing at the video uh, store yeah, yeah. you know because you know it's a public place or maybe I was just too distracted by you know maybe but both could be true I guess yeah but like it was just like that was a time where everything was just calm peaceful and I know what you mean because I have a similar similar experience for sure I think I felt the same way but I didn't have the same tension in my family you know that you did um, right. But I don't know what it was about it that provided that comfort or that calm, you know, certainly something. But one thing I wanted to kind of talk about, too, is how, you know, this is so pervasive. It's not just you and me. It's so many people in our generation, a little bit older, a little bit younger, who kind of uh, really are stuck in the past, you know. And I'm talking about the people who dress up um, in costumes for comic book conventions. I'm talking about... The fact that it is the number one topic, it seems, in TV comedies and TV shows, you know, it's a shorthand conversation, it's nerd talk, nerd language. Um, I guess I kind of wonder what that is doing to us, in a sense, do you know? Because, I mean, yeah, our parents didn't have this, the toys that we have, and therefore they don't really fetishize the things that they had as kids. But they don't fetishize anything they had as kids, it, it seems to me. You know, when I talk to my parents about their past... Just childhood, that's it, you grow up. You know what I mean? Right. You leave childish things behind. That's the point, right, of, of being an adult. And it seems to me like we're holding on a lot longer, a lot tighter. And I also uh, notice, you know, our, our generation plays video games more with their kids. You know what I mean? I started thinking about that, talking to some of my students, that, uh, you know, their parents are more like them than our parents were like us, I feel. You know, and I'm sure my parents didn't feel like their parents were anything like them at all. You know what I mean? Right. Going up in the 60s, that whole... Well, I mean... I'm not sure of a question there, by the way. Just what what do you think about that? No, I agree with you. I definitely... I think about it a lot. Like, we are this generation that um, it's almost afraid to grow up and to um, put on our big boy pants, I guess. And I wonder how much of that has to do with just the the fear of um, getting older because that means that's the next step to death, you know? 
Well, I guess, like, you know, I think about my grandparents' generation. They had, I mean, everybody's afraid of dying, right? And they don't deal with it in some way or another. But they also, they had the war. They had World War II. They had a big, giant war that kind of got everyone together, you know? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how, you know, my grandfather, I have letters from him that he wrote when he was 17 years old. 17, he lied about his age and joined the army. And he was writing his classmates from Germany and talking about how, you know, he had to kill little kids in order to get a clean, dry place to sleep for the night, you know, stuff like that. And they'd have to sleep underneath a tank in two inches of water and consider themselves lucky to have the shelter overhead, you know what I mean? I think about stuff like that, like, compared to how I was when I was 17, compared to how kids are today at 17, you know, and it's a whole different world, right? Like, just something completely unimaginable, I think, to your average American. No, yeah, you're right. I, so we don't have anything. You know, if you had a war and you survived it, there's not a lot of things for you to really be afraid of, you know, or a lot of things to really show um, your attachment to childhood or, or a need for it, I guess. That's what I'm guessing. No, we had um, we had the 80s and 90s that we survived through. And so, I mean... <laughs> so, yeah, you're right, survival in itself. Yeah, so we, you know, our, you know, whole childhood is just based around the television and the programs and the cartoons and all the commercials of the action figures that we're obsessed with and um the movies that we watched that were based off of some of those you know like the mm -hmm. ninja turtles movie you know yeah. uh you know so to me it's like you know our parent I, I tried looking back at my parents and you know wondering how I would be if I grew up like, you know, in the same time, the same town as my dad, like, would I be that kind of a person or would I still be me, you know, um, someone who's obsessed with movies, you know, because there are those guys, you know, from that era who are obsessed with films. I mean, how did we watch our movies if we didn't have people who love them to make yeah. them right? Yeah. So. Well, and that's a whole other component too. They, they start making, movies out of these things you know what i mean like teenage mutant ninja turtles the movie you know he man the movie but they never had like lincoln logs the movie you know Maybe tinker toys <laughs> the motion picture that would be awesome I mean, they might now but like they, it doesn't seem to me like anyone ever thought about shit like that for our parents barbie the movie that seems like an obvious one i right. don't remember that ever going anywhere they wait until like just recently to do gi joe Right? Yeah, but some of this stuff I feel we, you know, we tend to not really know our history in this either. You know, we talk, we roll our eyes at remakes. And, you know, you look back and you see, like, how a lot of 1950s movies were remakes of 1930s movies. And then 19, you know what I mean? So no, it's like, so like right. remakes have been a part of the story, like, forever. As long as there's been movies, there's been remakes. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. yes. I agree. I don't know what to do with that information, but, like, so I, what the... At the end of the day, it just shows a lack of imagination, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you, you can say that most stories are the same stories over and over again, right? The same themes are very prominent, especially in movies for entertainment. You know, love, unrequited love, revenge, things like that. Like, the themes are pl kind of played out. But, um, but to the deliberate of remaking of a story, characters, plot, like that is something to me that seems so annoying, you know? Mm -hmm. yes. Unnecessary. Very unnecessary. Um, it's insulting mm -hmm. because it's almost like these uh, big studios don't think that we can handle, you know, a new story that we need to know a familiar tale. We need to know a familiar name. We need to have this. We need to have the sense of familiarity, I yeah. guess, you know, um, or else we're not going to go and give them our money to go and see a new story. I mean, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people. I mean, the millennials are very... Uh, close-minded you know well yes we are you and me both <laughs> well i mean to the, even the you know the younger millennials yes the younger the <clears throat> they're just they're the, the, the attention span you know mm -hmm. just uh you know to use your you know for they have the attention span of a gnat yeah you know? they do um it's even hard to get them to watch a five minute video on their phone and they're already glued to their phone. Very difficult. Yeah, you know? I know. That's the other thing I think about, too, with my students. You know, all, virtually all of them claim they have attention deficit disorder, right? Virtually all of them. And yet they can stare at their phones for fucking days at a time and not move their eyes. 
You know? But they're how how many things are they going through? You know? I don't know, but I do know that they can at least pay attention to this thing inside their hand for a long period of time, all day long. Yes, that can somehow yeah. pull their focus. Absolutely. Do you think? I mean, do you, were we just as bad? Mm. You know, because I don't think that you know the human attention span is meant to sit through an hour and a half. Uh, at a, of a, a class, no, of a of a class at a time. No, movies too. I mean, you can't really pay attention to every detail of a film the first time through without thinking other things or have being distracted, right? I guess I can't. I mean, it depends. It depends on the movie, I guess. Well, some surely have you more wrapped than others, but I think in general we don't we don't have the types of attention spans to just give it a laser focus throughout an entire period of time that long. I, you know, I remember when I was in college, I had a sociology professor that said something like the average, I never checked the facts, by the way, but he said something like the average of human attention span is something like 15 minutes of just being able to stay in rapt attention for 15 minutes before it drifts off into something else, right? Right. And so he was kind of wondering, like, why do we have 50-minute class periods, hour and 15-minute class periods, depending on where you're at? Um and this is something that if we if academics have kind of agreed that 15 minutes is about it why are we still having hour long class periods it doesn't make any sense so i wonder if that is something really new i i definitely think attention spans are getting worse for sure getting worse yes yeah, i agree hours weren't that great either from no, what I remember. no 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 i mean as soon as i would sit down in my desk and you know my attention span would just be focused on until the last person sat down and the teacher started the lecture. Then, like, uh, it was, I was gone, mm -hmm. you know. And it, that was uh, something I had a really bad issue with. Like, I remember even in third, fourth grade, you know, I had to get pulled away from class and go and sit in, like, a, it was a closet, a storage closet that they converted into like a tiny little one-on-one -on -one classroom with some young lady who was there. <laughs> and I, I, I never understood what it was, but I guess I was being tested to see if I was retarded. No shit. <laughs> yeah. Are you, you know? kidding me? I guess just to like, not to use that word, but that's the only, that, that's why they fucking put That's me. the word they use. That's, that's <laughs> the word my dad used, that's for sure. You know? Uh, like, I just remember being in this classroom and playing with some like silly putty and some action figures <laughs> they had there and like it's so it like, already it's a return home to you yeah this you know brilliant. i just get to sit and play with yeah. toys for you know 45 minutes to an hour and she was just sitting there and talking to me with the clipboard and jotting down stuff and you know once the time was up i got to go back and i was like okay um i wonder what the hell they were observing I, because i had a hard time um Focusing, and I had a hard time with my, you know, just uh, like my grades are always really poor. Mm -hmm. And the teachers were like, well, he's not like goofing off. Because I was never a kid who just goofed off, you know? Really? I remember you being a silly fucker. Well, we were, well, when we had classes together and if we're yeah. sitting next to each yeah. other and shit like that. But like, I wasn't just like, I was the kid who was sitting at the desk, like looking up at the ceiling or just sitting there, you know, just looking at the teacher, but not listening to the teacher. I'm yeah. just thinking of, you know, blood sport or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What, other, what movie was I watched the night before or whatever, you know? Yeah. So, like, I just could not focus. And I think, like, you know, I just thought I had a learning disability, which I did, but it wasn't to the point where it's like. What was it? What was it? I think my, like, now, because I've gone to college, I've been able to pay attention, I've been able to do my work, you know, and I had good grades. It wasn't, it was just the fact that, like, I don't think I was able to do it their way, you know? Everyone yeah. has a different way of learning. Yeah, definitely. I'm convinced um, of that. The conventional 20 to 30 students in a classroom, one teacher, that's not the way I learn, you know? No. Unless I have, like, a lot of money on the line, like, going to school. Sure. Well, okay, that's interesting. So you can learn that way if you're financially invested. Well, I think, like, you have to be prepared to go... I mean, as a fucking kid, you know, no kid wants to go to school, so they're not invested in it. And when you're sitting there and you're but forced to do, do it. But some kids do, right? Like some kids well, some kids just have that ability. You know, know some people what are, it is. Some people have the I mean, you have the ability. You know, you pick up information. You retain the information. Most of the information I want, though. I mean, you've I always done well in school. No, I did not. That's not true. Not till college. Right, I was well. a pretty poor as well. 
very poor. I was a lot like you in that sense, like a bad grades, very bad grades. They thought that I had ADD too. And I was tested too. And when you were telling that story, I was kind of trying to remember if I was put in that same closet and given the same putty. I don't think so. But I was tested in other ways. <laughs> I don't remember. I, I just I have vague memories of an office in which I was, you know, having to like pick out shapes from a magazine or some something like that. I don't really remember the details of it, but I do remember it resulting in me getting put on Adderall or something. Hmm. Or Ritalin. Ritalin which was the um, uh, de jour medication of the time. So, but I, I never was convinced I had it. And then in college, I had a, prof- a German professor who was convinced that I had it, um, who was convinced, like, she, very flatteringly, she would compare me to Einstein and say that I was a genius, but I didn't realize, but, but I, I could not pay attention to anything for long enough to really grasp it. And so she convinced me to see a doctor. My doctor prescribed caffeine and candy bars, essentially. Basically said, yeah, you know, try, that helps with attention. Caffeine, dry Mountain Dew, Snickers. <laughs> I'm not fucking kidding. Medical advice. Brilliant. <laughs> but I guess in some ways it's better than pushing pills, unnecessary pills. Yeah. Which they were too often to do. I'm just going to come home with like a six-pack of Mountain Dew and yeah. a box of candy bars. Yeah, and I guess I did. Like I started drinking a lot of coffee and it helped, but I don't. Doctor's orders. Exactly. I don't know if I believe in it that much or not. Do you know what I mean? And now that I mean, I've worked with kids for, um, I guess, kind of the better part of four years now. And virtually every single student I've ever had, uh, it's been told to me they have ADHD. Well, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think um, comparing to like our, our, I don't know. I don't have that much background to my grandparents like you do. Yeah. But um, I don't even have that much background of my own parents. But thinking about my parents, myself, and then like my niece, nephew, and even Erica's nephews, um, the difference I can think of is when we were kids, I don't remember. I mean, what I remember like to get out of our parents' hair when they're trying to do what they do is they sit us in front of the fucking TV. Yeah. Here, they turn on the tube, bam. We're sitting there and we're distracted and they could go and they fucking have their peace and quiet or they're cleaning, they're doing whatever the fuck, they're getting dinner ready or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I find that, like, you know, we do the same thing but it's a lot more convenient. You know, whenever a kid's getting, like, rambunctious or, you know, antsy, we just give them the fucking phone here. And Definitely. Just I've noticed that too. Yeah. YouTube. Yeah. And, you know. It works. It works, and it's like yeah. so, you know, and they just with the swipe of a finger, you know, like a three year old kid knows how to guide that fucking phone, you know, Erica's yeah. nephew. I mean, he, you give him the phone, he knows, and he knows like how to like unlock shit. He knows how to, where to go. Mm-hmm. He knows what folders have what, what the icons mean, you know. And he's three years old. I mean, if he knew how to write, he wouldn't need us for anything. He could just go and find his own app, probably, you know. Yeah, but. It's just, a, it's weird. Like, you know, these kids are highly intelligent, but they don't seem like it. You yeah, exactly. Know? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Well, I, I always think about that, too, that, you know, when I, I meet young people who want to be like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, I met some really, really smart young people, and that's their goal. But I, I also have to kind of tell them that, like, but those, those guys didn't grow up with this shit. You know what I mean? They invented this this shit. You know what I mean? Like, right. They read you know, they and they studied and they, they worked at this craft for a long, long, long time that they all kind of grew up around this stuff. You notice those guys are all about the same age, too. But mm-hmm. like they grew up around the same time when, you know, people didn't have computers in their houses. And so you really had to go out of your way to learn this shit. And they did. They went out of their way. And so a lot of students I have or, or young people I meet who say that they want to do that. They don't seem to have any of that fortitude that those gentlemen had. You know what I mean? To, to, to just be um, persistent, goal oriented, and keep working, working, and working. You know. Um, and so, isn't that kind of weird and almost paradoxical that these guys who created something with all of that? They're I don't. I think inarguably hard, hard work that all of these guys put in. I can't remember the name of the guy who who pretty much invented the internet or the the, the most search browsers came from his ideas. They're all about the same age. It's like they all worked really, really hard on this stuff. And they created something that makes everybody's lives much, much easier, simpler, and more fun, uh, but, but also does not encourage them to work hard anymore. 
Hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. And everyone wants to be just like them. A lot of people do. You know, a lot of people do. Because they're very rich and they're very, very influential, you know. And so the people that they, that I noticed a lot, uh, my younger students, they tend to look up to uh, YouTube uh, creators, content creators, Instagram influencers, stuff like that. That that becomes somebody that they want to emulate. Absolutely. Yes. You know, everyone... I mean, it's like the podcast. Everyone wants to do a podcast. Everyone wants to Ooh. do <laughs> Everybody wants to do a YouTube channel, you know, have something, you know. Myself included. And it's, I don't know how to shake it. There's part of me that thinks it's so, so, so wrong. And yet I want to join too. Well, because it's a, it's a source of like getting all this creative energy out. You know, mm-hmm. everyone wants to be creative in a sense. Ah, that's... Do you think? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Everybody I wants do. to be creative. Everyone, well, everyone has that have. impulse. Yeah. They have something that they want to do, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, everyone thinks they have something special to say. That's right. Um, but you know what, though? Like, it, it, if you look at this in evolution, you know, you go all the way back to people who, who'd paint in the caves, right? Like those caves in France, you know? And, and that shit, it's not simple crude drawings, right? Like it looks like it, but that stuff is really beautiful and really captivating. They, the way that they would use the shapes and the rocks to... to uh, like replicate the bulges of the animal's chest and stuff like that. And to have done all that in the dark, you know, these were dedicated, dedicated artists. Every bit as dedicated as a Kanye or et cetera, right? Very dedicated, very precise. Um, but very few people can do that, right? There's a lot of people who need to provide the food for those people. And that's something that like our culture, I think, has really lost sight of, you know? And one thing that I do have to say that I will give a lot of the younger people today, and whoever's pushing this message, it's fucking working. Because I know also a lot of young people are like, I want to be a plumber because you know what? No one's fucking doing that. Those guys make a lot of money. And, you know, I got a lot of students who are like, I want to be an electrician. You know, I don't give a shit. They make good money. Yeah. And I like that. I like that there are people who are still driven to... Uh, want to make money, I guess, ultimately. But they, they, they want to do a trade that is very, very useful and very valuable to people. Absolutely, yeah. I wish I could. You know, I worked around a lot of journeymen, you know, a lot of master plumbers, you know. I worked around these guys, you know, for many years, you know. And I was always the odd man out. It's just I couldn't. And they made it look so easy, the things they do, you know. It's like, well, this is broken. It's like, well, okay, well, how do we fix it? Well, you know, I don't even know the first step on troubleshooting, you know, a, a motor if it bust, you know, or, you know. No idea. If, if a plunger doesn't work, I don't know how to fix a toilet. Right. You know? Right. I mean, there's stuff that, like, yeah, I, I was able to fake my way through a lot of it, but I just, man, I wish I was able to grasp how to do that kind of work. You know, it would made my life easier. Yeah, me too. You know, me if too. I just knew how to, you know, understand how to, fix something i guess i wonder if these people realize how much they really are contributing do you know i'm sure i hope so i mean i hope there's a sense of satisfaction in cleaning shit out of a clog drain i'm serious because it's really fucking important stuff it is you know like i worked with a plumber most of the time you know i was kind of his assistant you know and he was a miserable guy he i mean he had a shitty job literally i mean but I think there is a sense of like accomplishment when there, no matter what you're doing, if you if something's fucked up and is broken, and you go and you fix it and you use your own hands to like do that, and when you go and you hit that flusher and it works and no leaks, you know the water goes where it's supposed to go, and yeah, you yeah. know like you can't help but put your hands on your hips and nod, yeah, 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 you know like yeah. I did that, yeah. you know. I think anyone who ever, like, experienced, you know, putting something together and it's working and you did that. And it doesn't matter if that's something that you like or not. True. You know? Yeah. I, I, helped mean, a, I helped a dude install a toilet a couple months ago. I've never done anything like that in my life. I mean, like, just to think that that guy is, like, taking a shit on it right now. Uh, and without me, wouldn't have done it. Couldn't have <laughs> happened. It couldn't have happened. No. His shoulder was all fucked up. He couldn't lift the thing. And to think, like, he would just be sitting there pooping in a can right now if I didn't go and help him. Trying to aim into the hole that goes down. Into yeah, the, like, yeah. I'm kidding, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, you, I could definitely feel like I made a contribution, making somebody's life fucking easier than, than you know. But, like, it, so I was reading David Graver's book, Bullshit Jobs. Okay. And it's interesting how, you know, he kind of talks about how, um, you know, a lot, 
if we if some jobs disappeared tomorrow, how many of them would we really miss? You know, and you tick off kind of some of the obvious ones. Like if the garbage men disappeared tomorrow, we would notice them. Yes. If janitors disappeared, we would notice them. If teachers yes. and police disappeared, we would notice this. Any kind right? of civil service, you yeah. know. Well, not all of them. There's a lot of bullshit civil service jobs. But the DMV, would we care? No, we all <laughs> breeze. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. But you know, the people who work at the DMV, no, I don't think we would really miss them or notice them that much. But the people who, who really make our, our lives um, better, safer, and easier are the ones we would miss the most. Um, and I guess we have to almost add in, you know, computer programmers. I, I, hate, I almost hate to admit it, but it's true that... You know, th- think about some of the apps that you do use every day. Like, we can complain about this technology, but we were talking about how it, we embrace it when it makes our lives easier. Without it, we lived without it. We did live without all that shit. We did. Do you know what I mean? But, but we would notice it if it were taken away from us tomorrow. We would notice it, and we would probably suffer severely in the sense that you think about computer programming, and I was reading something, or you either probably told me or I read somewhere, but like, um, let's say that like a solar flare hit the yeah, earth yeah. and it took down the computers. You know, we would have no, you know, our water, you know, our gas. So much of the stuff is now on computers, you know, the make, you know, we would not be able to do so much. Mm-hmm. We'd be almost in the dark ages again, you know. Um, we rely heavily and computers and machinery, you know, like it operates almost everything we do, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, we would notice and we would suffer without that stuff and you know we kind of did it to ourselves that's true you know why would we make something like our water you know come to us on like you know a computer like machinery yeah yeah yes i agree why 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 do we do that to ourselves do you think um do you money i would assume like they won't have to pay someone well you know if you just programmed a, a, a machine to do something right that's true. Yeah, you no, have to pay you're, for right, the man, you're right. Then labor, you just have but to you, pay for you, the guy who can. But you know, in the back it. of your mind, that this is, could potentially go really wrong. I mean, right? they made movies about it. Exactly. We've yeah. Seen. So you. So we know. We know. Like Freud would say that we have a drive towards death. Right. He spoke of the death drive. Do you think that's what it is? That deep down we we we're willing it. We are collectively wanting to die, wanting the entire civilization to be destroyed. Um. Me personally, no. <laughs> well, I'm I speaking as a collective. I can right? see. I don't know. I mean, is there something? Is, because I guess Freud would say that like we enact those little impulses in ourselves all the time, right? Um, by doing bad things to ourselves, the things we know are poisonous, things that we know are hurting ourselves. Uh, yeah, I guess so, so. We're all individually doing it, and then collectively we're doing. And you always scratch your head wondering why, why, why did I drink so much? Why did I do that? Why, why, why? And you do it again and again and again, and you kind of wonder. You know, what is it that you, you know what this, you know where this is going. And so to keep going, you're, you're basically embracing it. And so if we know that these technologies potentially can also kill us, um, such as making the nuclear bombs, if we know that, that a simple solar flare can disrupt the entire power grid for the East Coast of the United States, we know these things and still build things accordingly, uh, are we pioneering risk takers, ballsy, uh, gutsy people, or are we, in a way, admitting that, like, you know, the whole thing could blow up in our faces, fuck it, you know? I think it's kind of, fuck it, you know? It's put money in my pocket right now, and a lot of it. You know? I think so. But do you think, like, all of these rich people, though, they can't all be thinking that, can they? Are, are, is that what they're doing? Are they all thinking, fuck it, I just want money for me? Or do you think some of them, because, like, how much can you make, right? How many pairs of pants can you wear? How many fucking dinners can you fucking eat? Do you know what I mean? And most of these guys have to think that, like, I got to do something with this money or with this time or with my life. I'm sure many of them confront these facts. Some of them are too busy with their own death drives and their own fucking, you know, raping interns if you're Harvey Weinstein or... Uh, whatever like you're too wrapped up in very very destructive shit to really confront those demons Mm -hmm. some people are great multitaskers like harvey weinstein (laughs) could probably do both do good and evil all in the same day um while producing shakespeare in love (laughs) i don't know what tangent i'm going on but i'm just thinking that like it can't all be profit i'd like to think it's not all profit driven because it can only take you so far it can only take you so far but i mean i can't say anything out of experience because i'm I'm broke, but I mean, I imagine money is very addicting. 
you know? Yeah, that's true. I'm pretty sure yeah. that power is very addicting. And I'm pretty sure, you know, these guys, once they have that, you know, I mean, look at Trump. I mean, I mean, the guy's just so addicted to, I mean, well, himself. Yeah. But, you know, this legacy, you know? And I think that's all it is. You know, they want to leave something behind, too, even if it's bad. You know, we're, the world's going to... Who do you think they're leaving it for? It doesn't matter. Whoever's going to listen. Yeah. That's what I think. You know? I, I can imagine a person like that doesn't give a shit what kind of a legacy he leaves behind. As long as he's leaving something behind. And all the stuff, I mean, how many times have scientists, you know, given him, like, what we're continuing to do is harming our planet. We need to do something so our kids can have a plan. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure these guys are like, fuck your kids. I'm going to be dead soon. Right. You know, I don't give a shit about the people tomorrow. I'm living for today. Right. And maybe that's what it is, you know? Hmm. That's a good point. I, I want to kind of tie it back into the nostalgia thing for a bit, too. Uh, there's something else about the, the toys themselves, right? The f- physically holding a toy. The fact that, uh, I guess what you said about legacy reminded me of that, that you're, you're passing something down in a sense, something physical, mm-hmm. right? Um, those action figures. Um, whereas a lot of the things that these, that, that kids after us, and the generations after us, the, the, they don't seem to really even care as much about toys. Like no. they care very much more about media, right? Yes. Things that you can't touch, things that you can't really hold. Or paths down like apps and games. Um, what what is that going to do? Do you think? What 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 does it mean that we I, we had toys, but we at least had to activate our imagination? Yes. And now it seems like their imagination is being activated for them. Right, but does that make sense? It does. Yeah. It does. I mean, and I've experienced it several times. You know, always putting myself as the person who would be. Um, receiving the gift instead of giving the gift i would always buy a gift that i would want as a kid yeah for a child and they look at it like seriously mm-hmm. you know this is a piece of plastic i want to i want a video game you know yeah and that's like my nephew and you know a few years back my stepbrother you know is quite a few years younger than me so i remember buying him some spider-man action figures for one of his birthdays and he just kind of looked at it like oh okay but then, like, the next box he opened up was, like, a PS2. And he was like, that's the fucking gift I wanted, that, you know? Oh, man. So I was like, oh, how can I comp- compete with that, you yeah, know? Yeah, how can you? But, I mean, like, I don't know. I'm, not to change the subject, but when I was a kid, you know, my dad would always tell me, you know, you were the easy one because, you know, I can go and I could buy all your Christmas gifts for 50 bucks, you know? And you would have a pile of G.I. Joe's. And you'd mm-hmm. be fucking happy. But then I'd just have to spend like $150 to $200 on your sisters just to buy like a Barbie dream house or some clothes and CDs. And, you know, and they didn't have as much gifts, but, you know. That's one thing that definitely seems to be the truth no matter what generation is that every parent is a bit disappointed in their kids' love of their toys, right? I guess. It seems yeah. like it. Yeah. You know, what was wrong with blocks? I love blocks. Right. You know? No, my dad. What was wrong with grass? My grandfather might have said. <laughs> I liked playing in grass. <laughs> That's all we had, and we loved it. Like it does. That seems to be the case. Yeah. And I notice a lot because we don't have kids. No. Uh, but we're around people who do. Unfortunately. And it seems that my yes. friends who have kids, they kind of say the same. They're a bit disappointed that their kids don't seem to be as interested in what they were. Yeah. Um. I have. Well. I'm trying to think. Like, I'm more disappointed in the fact that my nephew is not into the things that I'm into, but he's more into the things that his dad's into, you know? I mean, they're both big, you know, video game bums. Yeah. They just sit in front of the TV and play video games, you know? And when you're, you know, and I look at my sister's husband and I just see him sitting on the couch playing video games probably about 90% of the time that I'm over at the house and his son's sitting there watching him play. And... That, when you look at that, it's kind of hard for. I mean, what are you? What kind of a role model is that? Or what are you trying to uh, show your child that this is okay? You know. But then you know, I have met those, and I've dated um, girls who had younger brothers who were nothing like their fathers. You know, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking of like Yvette. You know, mm-hmm. her brother was this piano player. You know, and his dad was this giant jock. You know this meathead and he had this like really kind of soft spoken you know kid who just played the piano yeah and that's what he wanted to do and 
he was so disappointed that he wouldn't sit down and watch the Bronco game with him. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, I can see that. But, I mean, I think, like, I will, my dad was really big into, like, is big into hunting and fishing and camping. You know, he's an outdoors guy, and I can't be bothered with that shit, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm. I don't mind fishing, and I don't mind camping. I mean, I can do the hunting, but, you know, as a kid, I hated that shit. You know, I think as an adult, you kind of, you know what, there is kind of a something really nice about sitting there and doing nothing, but look like you're doing something. I mean, I do this at work all the time anyways. Yeah, You know, definitely. I can just sit there, and it's very relaxing just throwing a, you know, a line in the water and just... It is. No distractions. Exactly. Uh, um, um, kind of a final note, I wanted to bring this up. I don't know if I got the quote correctly. Um, something that uh, Tony Soprano said in The Sopranos. He said that... Uh, Reminiscing is the lowest form of conversation. That's a quote that's often brought up from that show. What do you think of that? I agree to a sense. I mean... I'm sure he stole it from someone. Probably. Reminiscing. Uh, Yeah, I could definitely see how we're talking about something that's already happening and we're not really talking about something that is happening now, something current, you know? So I guess that... but I like reminiscing. <laughs> so do I. Yeah, I, guess, I mean, do I just like low forms of conversation? I like it to a degree, but I think I hit limits. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And I like it with certain people. Yes. And I mean, certain people, people, people I can sim- And I think it's because, you know, we like it because we have the sim. We, we grew up with each other, so when we're reminiscing, we're talking about ourselves. Yeah. A. Yeah, that's um, really the point of it, I think. Yeah. You know, and things that we, you know, even if we were not there... Um, well, let me take a step back. All right, so I think when we reminisce, it's um, it's a form of storytelling too, especially when there's other people. When there's other people around who didn't grow up with us. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that's just the narrative in us. Yeah. You know, coming out just like you know, because we add in so much, we're not just telling it like you know, like oh man, and so this so this happened. You know, we build it up. We give it yeah. like you know, plot points. You know. Oh, so yeah. One thing that I've been always kind of obsessed with to a certain degree is this idea of basically wiping out your past and acknowledging almost n- none of it. Um, maybe I can better explain. There's this biography of uh, Stalin I read, right? And there was a playwright. I think it might have been Bulgakov who was hired to write a play about Stalin's life. And so he went back on this train to uh, the small town Gori in Georgia where Stalin was from. And the train gets stopped. And after some uh, ruckus, uh, the train is turned back around and sent back to Moscow. And you can imagine, like, that's a pretty big deal, right, to turn around an entire train, um, not knowing exactly why. It was later revealed or at least believed that the whole purpose of turning the train around was to prevent Bulgaka from going back to Stalin's town, right? Just one guy and one one passenger on this train. Um, because Stalin did not want anyone poking around in his childhood and didn't want anyone telling stories from his childhood. He wanted to control that narrative precisely, you know? Anything that the public knew about him, it came from him and not anybody else, right? And it was carefully crafted and I think that like there's something about that I can really really identify with you know I think I mean I've read that as an adult but my my childhood I think I spent trying to craft it cleverly in ways that would suit my narrative my my the way I wanted to tell my story and as an adult I wanted it even more to basically disavow a childhood and to be able to keep all that wiped away you know get rid of all pictures acknowledge nothing you know uh yes i do know and i think uh, some people do that so what, what could what would people be afraid of finding out you know what i mean well i mean in my case like well that think I, about that I liked aerosmith <laughs> like in stalin's case like what well i mean let's let's look at it from a like you know 15 or 16 year old uh point of view right mm-hmm. so you know, that's the time when you're trying to, uh, like, kind of create an identity, mm-hmm. you know? So you're reinventing yourself. Um, and it's almost like, you know, all right, 
Airheads, right? Mm-hmm. You know, Brendan Fraser's character. Mm-hmm. And then they find out, you know, he liked to D&D, and his name isn't Chaz, it's Chester. You That's know? right, yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, this image you have, you don't want people thinking that you're something different. You know, if you're this yeah. rocker guy, fucking leather coats and black long hair, you know, and fucking piercings in your face, and then they look at you like five years ago, and you had short, nerdy blonde hair glasses, and you wore sweater vests, you know. Those are these are phases we've kind of been through, actually. right? Yeah. But you know, I'm saying, yeah. saying, you know, like yeah. a lot of people kind of like, you know, yes, they'll they'll yeah. they, they'll, they'll fabricate like yeah. things that happen, you know, like of course, yeah. you know, they'll hear a story and then they'll put themselves in it, mm-hmm. you know, say so this and make it their own story in a sense. Yeah, I think everyone kind of does it to some. Yes, you're right. I guess there's something kind of normal about that. You know, there's you want to seem cool all the time. Yeah, definitely. There's something. There's tremendous power in being able to create your own narrative, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Being able to create your own myth, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You create your own origin story. Basically, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. I mean, we've all done that. We're all guilty of it. Certainly. Just, I don't think I've ever, I would ever, you know, take a train and turn it around so people can't dig up my past in Jersey. Some guys <laughs> like driving from Denver to Jersey, like, I gotta get the truth on Ricky. I don't, th- that's the thing is like, I don't think I have anything that I have to be horribly ashamed of but certainly enough to turn a train around (laughs) well ricky i think this was a great talk man thanks for coming and chatting about nostalgia with me thank you for having me and hopefully we do this again definitely yes there's more stuff we need to talk about all right till next time bye-bye we've got a lot of amazing things yeah